between all the testing and the uploading of documents and the talking to the border guards, all the hoops you have to jump through, traveling to the States sounded like a daunting task. We weren't sure we wanted to do it. But then Cannon said they have a camera that you control with your eyeball and it might actually work this time. Off we go. Welcome back, DPRB TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here. Yes, we're indeed in beautiful Seattle, and it's been so great to see the DPRB team. It's been a long time since we got to see them in person, and we missed them a ton. We also have a great event going on here because Canon has brought up the EOS R3, and we actually get to play with it hands-on. I do want to mention that these are pre-production cameras, so this is not going to be a full review video. We will absolutely do one of those once we get our hands on production bodies, but there's still a lot that we can cover. Now, we've already made videos about things like spec rundowns. There's lots of information out there on the specs. What I really want to cover in the video today is going to be things like how the camera handles and feels, how the camera auto focuses, and what this brand new sensor is going to do for your image quality. Now Jordan's also going to come in and talk about video features and he's actually shooting tonight on a Canon EOS R3 so that's a nice little treat. Okay, so we've got hands now on the Canon EOS R3. Of course, this has a battery grip design. We've known that from the mock-ups, but what really surprises you when you pick it up is actually how light it is. So this is about 1,015 grams. That's essentially half a knock. That's 2.237692 pounds roughly, actually pretty precisely, and that's with the battery in. So I like that it's got a nice stable feel to it. It's comfortable, but certainly much lighter than a 1DX3. Now, despite this camera being quite a bit smaller and lighter than a 1DX body, it still has the exact same kind of magnesium alloy construction. We've got the same kind of ruggedness and weather sealing, so certainly it's going to be a dependable body. From a design standpoint, it's kind of an interesting mix between something like an R5 and a 1DX body. The top plate looks very SLR-ish. I mean, you've got drive autofocus, multiple exposure settings, metering combinations. Those are very reminiscent. All the ports down the side, very similar, although it does seem shaved quite quite a bit tighter to the lens, so a little bit smaller there. The grip feels fantastic, very much like what you'd expect out of a full-size camera. Uh, we do have this nice little mode dial here though, which I like from the R5, and a lot of the other controls on the back panel look like a 1DX3. Now, as far as media slots on the side of the camera, we've got an SD card slot and a CF Express card slot. Now, I do like having the SD card slot because I'm old-fashioned and they're cheap and I've already got a lot of them, but there is some debate that it would have been nice to have twin CF Express card slots here. That way you get the same speed, the same throughput on both slots. Of course, lots of buttons on here that you can customize, but in the past, Canon have often limited what buttons can be customized to do what, and that's been opened up in a big way on this camera. You can customize this camera to behave pretty much however you want. Now, otherwise, we do have a brand new multi-function hot shoe here. There aren't any accessories that we can play with yet, but this is gonna expand the camera in some very interesting ways. And as far as the EVF goes, I do like how much relief you get off the back of the camera keeps your nose nice and clear. Touch screen on the back of the camera, you can use that as a classic interface to choose your autofocusing point. You also have an autofocusing joystick here on the back. That's also a very good way to do it. Now we also do have the smart controller. This is what we had on the 1DX3. Love it or hate it, it is an interesting feature where I can pass my thumb across the AF on button and move the focusing point in that direction. And finally, the return of eye control autofocus. I know this is something that you really want to hear about, so we're going to absolutely play with this tomorrow. But this basically will track the movement of your eye, move the autofocusing point across the EVF to where you're looking, and let you select your autofocusing point that way. It's very dynamic, it's very interesting, and I'm excited to learn how to use it properly tomorrow. We're going to go and shoot some wildlife, we're going to shoot some sports. Should be a good test for the Canon Yas R3. So, let's get to shooting. All right, Jordan, the camera reviewers need this. There's an R5 in the corner, it's for you. Okay, so we're gonna start our day. We're here at Seattle Pacific University soccer pitch and I've got the Canon EOS R3 in hand. I got a really nice 100 to 500, haven't had a chance to play with that yet. So the players coming out on the field, we're about to get started, but I do wanna mention that first off, we have limited amount of cameras and uh, the rest of the DPRV team are out here as well. They're gonna be taking shots too. So we're gonna have to share. All right, so we're about to get shooting. There's a lot of different autofocusing settings I gotta get a handle on, but let's talk about my initial settings here. I definitely wanna test out eye control autofocus. So I've got the bank 
that I've chosen, now I'm gonna do multiple calibrations. And the more data you give the camera, the better a job it should do. So I could do uh, calibrations under sunny conditions like we have today, cloudy conditions I would do, indoors, absolutely. Uh, having the camera horizontal, vertical orientation. So I've done multiple calibrations, pretty simple. It basically just directs you to look at a point, hit the manual function button, and then it stores that, and then you'll get a calibration after multiple changes. I'm setting up my camera here, getting it ready to shoot. You can actually store eye control settings in six banks. So we're just gonna you know, keep track of whose number is who, and that way we can reset the camera for each person very quickly and easily. The other thing too, of course, is we can store the camera settings on our individual memory cards. So I'm gonna do that as well. That way, when I get a camera back, I can just load what I like to do and start shooting without having to go through the process from square one again. Now I'm also gonna try the Canon people priority settings. So these are machine learning techniques where it should then intelligently pick up people's faces, bodies, help me to track them more accurately. I'm gonna see how that works. So as far as shutter goes, I think I'm honestly gonna to stick to electronic shutter for most of the day today for a few reasons. First off, of course, we wanna test out the sensor. We wanna see what the read speed is, what kind of rolling shutter we're we gonna get. And there'll be a lot of situations where you wanna use a camera like this in quieter situations. You don't wanna have any shutter noise. Uh, the other thing, of course, is for burst rates. This camera can shoot up to 30 frames per second with tracking in electronic shutter mode. I'm gonna to stick to 15 right now, but with mechanical, I'd be limited to 12, and I think we'll save mechanical shots for our full review when we have a production camera. So I do really wish that I could show you a visual of how the eye control is working and tracking things because it really is quite dynamic, but it actually won't pass it through to the Ninja through the HDMI out. And obviously we can't stick like a phone or camera up to the EVF because then there's no eyeball for it to actually show the tracking. So the soccer pitch is a very good test just because we have multiple players out here, lots of faces uh, right now at a fair distance. So they're quite small in the frame. And so far the eye control is working pretty well. If I look at a particular player, engage the shutter, it seems to be choosing that person's face. So I'm pretty impressed with that so far. Um, as well, I'm also finding that I'm using the zone setup a lot because you can customize the shape and size of that. So for example, for soccer, I'm actually setting up sort of a people-shaped zone, skinny but tall. And then as long as I get my subject in that box, I can use my eye detect on the back button. It's locking onto that person as well. So it's very quick. I don't have to worry about recomposing. So of course, when you're shooting sports and wildlife, you want a camera that can certainly have a high burst rate, but also sustain that with a big buffer. So Canon's saying about 150 shots if you're shooting raw, 150 shots if you're shooting raw plus JPEG. So we did a test ourselves here. Wow. Oh, five seconds? That's a lot of pictures. Raw plus JPEG, we got roughly five seconds of burst at 30 frames per second, and we got 137 pictures on the card. So certainly a good sustainable rate. So it's hard to pull ourselves away, but I think uh, it's time to go to the zoo. All right, so we've taken a quick trip to the beautiful city of Tacoma. We're now at the Point Defiant Zoo, and this is gonna give us a good opportunity to shoot wildlife with this particular setup. I have, of course, remembered with Jordan's reminding to switch over to Animal Priority, which has traditionally been very effective on the other Canon cameras we've used. So I'm eager to try that out here today and see how that works with our eye control autofocus. So we've got the sea lions here. You can see they're just popping out of the water, but I don't know exactly where they're gonna pop out. And this is where the eye control autofocus makes a lot of sense just from a use case where I don't know where it's gonna be and if I'm trying to wait for the sea lion to come up out of the water, then move a focusing point to it and then try to track it, it's way too late. Whereas with eye control, I could just be scanning the water and then just instinctually when it comes out of the water, I look there, I touch the shutter and it starts tracking. It's still challenging to get photos, but that's where I could see this making a lot of sense. So with the limited time we've had here taking pictures of animals at the zoo, I'm gonna say the experience has been very positive. I'm getting a good hit rate. It's tracking animals very well. I could very easily set this up a lot like the R5 or R6, and that's always been great. I always feel like the animal detect does a great job. The only difference in the experience really on this camera being that I can also do eye control autofocus, and then that will be my initial point where I'll then follow animals that are nearby. Taking pictures of birds in flight has been doing a good job of that. Uh, animal static, no problem, very easy for this camera. I also wanna talk about the third priority 
third-party option, which is for motorsports. This is a new feature, but unfortunately, we haven't had any opportunity to test it here in these couple days. But the idea there being that we'll track vehicles. Now, specifically, though, I should point out, not really passenger vehicles. It's really designed to look for race cars, Formula One kind of stuff, sport bikes as well. And it does actually have an option called spot detection, which is cryptic because it doesn't really seem to make sense to me. But uh, my understanding is this will then let it actually focus on riders' helmets that are exposed, say in an F1 race car or on top of a motorcycle, uh, as opposed to the whole vehicle itself. So interesting features, fun to test in the future when we have a full production camera. I want to talk about the EVF here. It's a very high spec EVF, 5.76 million dots. You can have a refresh up to 120 frames per second, which has been great for the sports action and wildlife that we've been shooting today. But it does also have an optical viewfinder simulation mode. And this is meant to mimic a true optical viewfinder out of an SLR. It's a feature which we kind of would at first thought think is a silly feature, but we've actually all been using and enjoying. So the idea is this, first off, it turns off any exposure simulation. So as I change exposure manually or an exposure comp, it does not reflect that change in the viewfinder. It also turns off any sort of um, profiles that you may have set as far as color and contrast. So if I go to black and white mode, the optical viewfinder sim is still in color. So if it's turning off all of the things that we consider benefits to an electronic viewfinder, then why use it? Well, it's because it does make use of the HDR display that we have in the EVF, and this gives us wider dynamic range. It actually does a fairly good job of mimicking what an optical viewfinder would look like. It's not a gimmick, it's actually quite an interesting feature, and you might find yourself using it more often than you think. Now, of course, I wish I could demonstrate this to you there at home, but first off, it's not gonna translate well an HDR display over the standard dynamic range that you're looking at in this video right now. Also, it doesn't really go through the HDMI out, just like all the other cool features that we wanna visualize to you with this camera. So you really gotta have it in hand to appreciate what it'll do for you. So in previous videos, they hinted that we would have better flash sync capabilities with electronic shutter. But what we've tested now here is that we get up to 180th of a second in electronic shutter mode, which is fantastic. And unlike the Sony where you actually have to go through TTL flash systems to make that work, this seems to work with a lot more options. We've done a little bit of testing. We used a transmitter on top, just single pin. That sent out a signal properly through the PC sync port will also work. And I do also want to point out that the TTL configuration on the hot shoe is the same is the old one. So even though we've got the new multifunction features here, you can still put the older speed lights on here and they'll sync up just fine as well. And we did also find out that the camera will focus down to minus 7.5 EV at f1.2. And actually that did work quite well when I was shooting in the dark aquarium through glass. It still seemed to be picking up the autofocus quite well. However, we did bring along a 600 millimeter f11 lens just to see if it would let us focus outside of the central area. Sadly, it still will not, but we thought you guys might want to know that. Next feature is something Canon users have been waiting for for a very long time. It used to be in the past with Canon that if you want to do a custom white balance setting, you'd have to take a picture of a gray card, for example, it would go on your memory card, you'd then have to reference back to it to load the white balance setting, and it was just a really annoying <laughs> setup. Now you can actually take a custom white balance setting live right off the screen. This is something everybody else has been giving their users for a long time, and now it is for Canon as well. Incredible. I know you guys are cheering at home. I know everybody's waiting to get on the bus and get out of here, but quick stop at the gift shop. Got kids, you gotta, gotta bring something home. I'll be right back, I won't be long. So with this charming musical interlude, it is time to say goodbye to the Canon EOS R3. We have to give them back, but uh, we will see you very soon for our final conclusions. It's our final day, Jordan and I are flying out, but look, we found bubbles for you guys because it's a celebration. We've had a good time with the Canon EOS R3. Yes, Canon has taken it back, but we did get, I'd say a day pretty much to play with it. So again, there's only so much we could talk about. And the first thing we really wanna talk about is the new sensor. Now, it's 24 megapixels. I didn't see any real issues that stood out to me. It looks very similar to what we'd have expected out of another 24 megapixel sensor, but this is Canon's first full frame stack sensor. And that's unique because we were very concerned about the read speeds. And what I'm gonna say here is that we've tested it and we think it's gonna be roughly just under 200th of a second that's excellent. We've already touched on the 108th of a second sync speed. You got to think there's a lot of mechanical shuttered cameras out on the market that would be very similar for sync speed specs. So I happily shot the entire day just electronic shutter mode. And where there are compromises to image quality like dynamic range, 
it's too early for us to tell. We looked at the photos, we can't open the RAWs, you know, we can only look at JPEGs. So we're gonna save evaluations on dynamic range, low light performance and resolution till we actually get a final camera and we can really evaluate it properly. However, I didn't feel like the electronic shrouder was holding me back in any way, shape or form. Even doing like soccer, quick pans and tests of Jordan stuff, I didn't get any rolling shutter. And of course that also goes along with the autofocus. Now, we've already talked a bit about it. So my final conclusion is really this. Although you can shoot the camera very much so in a traditional focusing sense, it's clear that it really shines when you treat it as a dedicated tracking of subject kind of camera. Everything that we could use, the smart controller, the eye control autofocus, all the different autofocusing points and zones, customizing the shape of our zones, it all really was just a way of getting the focus to our initial point so we can start tracking subjects. And I did find the Yas R3 worked very well with that in conjunction with at least what we were able to test, animal priority and face priority. Now of all the different methods to acquire your subject and start tracking it, the eye control autofocus was by far the most interesting and I ended up relying on it heavily that day. It does actually work very well. Uh, there were scenes where I have multiple players looking at me but I would just look at the point of action that I wanted, the camera would automatically acquire the face and it felt very natural and very fast. I mean that's the key thing. But you know as users were using eye control and then going to cameras that didn't have it again, I actually found it very disorienting and you really kind of wish that you had it back. I do want to say that there's still situations where it flaked out a little bit or where it lost tracking of where your eye was looking or you had to recalibrate. Again, it's a pre-production camera, but in situations where I want absolute precision and I'm not relying on coupling it with a priority mode, I might then actually go back to a single point or moving my point around and really placing it where I want. Now, as far as tracking autofocus accuracy goes, the hit rate, the accuracy of the tracking, I felt was very similar to something like the R5, which is a good thing because that camera has always pleased us with this autofocus performance. Again, this is something you need more time with that I want to test more heavily. But I did enjoy it. Now let's talk about video and we'll go to Jordan for that. Hey everyone, it's Jordan here to talk about the R3's video functionality. And unfortunately, I got very little time with the camera, so I can't talk to it too much. Also, I wasn't able to record log video or raw video with the camera. But if you're looking to know the record modes, head on over to dpreview.com. They've got a full list of all the video functionality this camera can offer. There are a few things that I noticed though. First of all, I really like that the video is oversampled in 4K going up to 60 frames per second. So very sharp video coming off it. However, we are finding that the rolling shutter is worse in video mode than it is in photo mode. We're saying it's a little over half the speed we're seeing in photo. So it's actually still surprisingly good, but you will notice some diagonals if you've got a fast pan or you're in a moving vehicle or something like that. I was also able to shoot a little bit of 4K 120p. Now this is not oversampled, so we'll have to take a look at the image quality compromises a little later on that. But what I can say is, Chris was shooting for about an hour. I grabbed the camera from him, shot about over the course of four minutes, maybe a minute of 4K 120 footage, and we had an overheat warning on the camera. Now, I didn't push it to see how long before the camera would shut down because we really needed the camera to photograph sports, but I am pretty concerned, and this is something I'm really gonna test when we get a production camera. This eye control system Chris keeps talking about looks really sweet and it would be great to have it in video, but at this point it seems to be strictly for photography, but they could maybe do something in firmware. We'll see what happens, but I'll have a lot more information about using the R3 for video when we get a production sample and do our full review. Back to Chris. Now the burning question, I know you guys all want answered. Chris, how did you deal with a camera that has an integrated battery grip? Because we know you hate that. Well, it was tolerable because the SR3 is that lightweight and compact, much smaller than you expect it to be. But I used that grip zero times. Still, I'm happy that I had it only because it holds a really big battery and honestly, battery life didn't blow us away. Again, this is pre-production. We're going to test this in the full review, but I would say all in all, we probably got a good four to five hours of solid shooting with some video in there and it was tapped out. So I do feel you're going to want multiple batteries, absolutely, and that you're not going to be blown away by the battery life. Anyways, uh, we had a great time here in Seattle. It's sad to go. It was great to see the team again. They were so helpful. We really appreciate it. It was a busy day yesterday, but uh, thanks for joining us. Please do check out the links in the description below. You can see the sample galleries, and you know there's going to be tons of articles on Deep Review that you're also going to want to check out for this new camera. Otherwise, thanks for joining us. We'll see you back in Calgary soon.